Um, it's good to see so many of you here on a pretty big night, actually. I'm Sonia Lundy, the Deputy Director for Planning and Program at the Utah Museum of Fine Arts, and I'm happy to welcome you to the main library branch. The UMFA is thrilled to be presenting tonight's program as part of the museum's year-long programming series, Art Landish, Landscape Art and the Environment, a series of talks, films, meetups, and more that explore our complex relationship with the world around us. Um, I just want to let you know that our next event is actually on Thursday, August 25th, and is entitled Erasing Landscapes, Looting and Destruction from Syria to Utah. Many of the world's cultural heritage sites from the Middle East to our very own state face increasing threats from vandalism, theft, and destruction. Join us here at the main library for a panel discussion that will explore these issues. And please check our website for schedule updates throughout the year. Um, and this is just a reminder that all Artlandish programming is free and open to the public. Before I introduce tonight's lecturer, I want to thank Artlandish presenting sponsor, the SJ and Jesse E. Quinney Foundation for their support of this series, as well as our community partners, the University of Utah College of Fine Arts, the J. Willard Marriott Library, and of course, the Salt Lake City Public Library. Tonight's presentation is titled Studio Without Walls, Living Creatively Across Disciplines. Please be sure to stay for a Q&A immediately following the presentation. Now it is my pleasure to introduce tonight's lecturer, Stephen Goldsmith. Stephen Goldsmith is an associate professor in the University of Utah's College of Architecture and Planning. In 2011, he was appointed to the university's professor, uh, he was appointed the university's professor for campus sustainability. He teaches courses in urban ecology, empathic sustainability, and green communities through the U's Capstone Initiative Program. As the director for the Center for the Living City, an organization founded with the support and encouragement of Jane Jacobs, he collaborates with city builders around the world to preserve, enhance, and restore the places they love. His book, What We See, co-authored with Lynn Elizabeth, won the Jane Jacobs Urban Communication Prize in 2010. He was the founder of Artspace, a community development corpora corporation that develops affordable housing and workspace in Salt Lake City. Stephen is a creator across disciplines, including becoming the first artist planning director for a major US city where he served in that role during, the Salt, during Salt Lake City's 2002 Winter Olympic Games. During the games, he produced an international exhibition and symposium titled The Physical Fitness of Cities, Vision and Ethics in City Building in collaboration with architect and planner Moshe Softy, who also designed this building. Last fall, he traveled with the noted former Brazilian mayor, Jamie Lerner, on a coast-to-coast -coast trip celebrating Lerner's book, Urban Acupuncture. In 2015, their collaboration launched the Global Urban Acupuncture Network. He serves as president of the Salzburg Congress for Urban Planning and Development. Stephen's work as a sculptor can be seen in many public art projects in Salt Lake City, including his collaboration with Boyd Blackner on the Seven Canyons Fountain in Liberty Park and the design of City Creek Park with landscape architect Jan Streifel. Jan or Jan? Jan. Please join me in welcoming Stephen Goldsmith. Thank you very much. I, um, I'm, I'm amazed that um, so many of you have come out here tonight, and I, I thank you so much. Thank you to the UMFA for making this possible. Um, but really, an extra special thanks to all of you who would come out on this historic night of uh, the history of this country. Um, so I, I thank you very, very much. Um, I never thought I'd be competing with Hillary. And so you're doing something artlandish by being here. Um, <laughs> I'm going to dive right into the presentation, and, and what I hope to do tonight is to provide you with some cairns, some, some little markers, some scraps, um, some archaeology of my experience as a creator, and, and, and much of what I'll be talking about um, was mentioned in the, uh, uh, in the introduction. And when I say that I'm a creator instead of an artist, 
It's because I've observed that while the tools and materials change, the creative process always stays the same. It's a presentation about creative responses to uh, a host of challenges that I have faced, that many people face in their lives. Um, sometimes it's about identity, sometimes it's about meaning. Um, some of the challenges that I have uh, worked on have been practical challenges. Uh, Sometimes there have been urgent responses to events that have engaged me for, for a host of reasons. Um, and as I bombard you with images tonight, and there will be a lot of them, um, I hope you will see some patterns emerge. Some of the images are, are truly scraps. <coughs> Excuse me, they're, they're pixelated sort of digital remnants that uh, I've pulled out of boxes and scrapbooks. And um, um, they're, 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 there's um, a lot of stories in here um, there are stories of um, people, there are stories of collaborators, of disruptors, uh, stories of enablers, of benefactors, um, stories of resistance, stories of advocacy. All of these play into the process of creation that I have, again, had the privilege of, of, of working on. And, and I hope you'll bear with me as I, as I really do bombard you with these, these images. And I'm going to start with pieces, um, what we usually describe as art pieces. Um, from there, I'll slide into, uh, from, from my studio um, to the idea that I was creating walls, the, the art space piece of this. I've been to building neighborhoods, um, uh, then on to our valley and the ecology of our valley. Um, and then at the end, I hope to cool you off a little bit of water. Here we go. My experience as a creator began with the narrative of what sculptors do, what craftsmen do. I made a lot of objects. Uh, they were in galleries and exhibitions and museums, you know, all per the usual of what artists do. And people encouraged me to keep making things. Uh, in this ex exhibition that you see, this was uh, when I was a very young man. Um, I had the privilege of, sh of doing a show in tandem with uh, the iconic Utah painter Don Olson. Um, I discovered the things I was, was making at the time were actually affecting people. Um, they liked what I was doing. Um, the, the pieces were about my own challenges, my questions. Um, I was living these questions by making things that addressed my anger, my angst, and my despair. My creative responses at that time were being overwhelmed by such things as genocide, genocide of native peoples in particular, uh, the Holocaust, the World War II, um, environmental disaster. These were affecting me deeply, and I was a hard, having a hard time making my way through um, this understanding of where we were in the history of the planet. Um, this is a piece that I made in response to that. It's titled For Implantation in the Forearm. And it was uh, actually a, a miniature uh, circuit breaker, actually a square D brand. I'll, I'll show you the actual piece it was taken from uh, a little later. Um, and it, it was the idea was that I could implant it in my forearm, and it would have circuit breakers in it. Uh, can't quite see them there. They're, they're in there, though, but just miniature little circuit breakers, so that when I would get to that point of exasperation about one of these topics, they would click in. You know, just like you would have in your house. But they would click in. It was connected to my central nervous system. Uh, it didn't work. Um, unfortunately, it didn't work. And, and these were, I did a, a series of these pieces which embodied uh, a word that Marcel is credited with, Marcel Duchamp is, is credited with creating, which was pataphysics. Pataphysics being the irrational solutions to irrational problems. Not necessarily irrational problems as we're grappling with the um, despair that we feel, but how do we do that? Um, each of us does it differently. Um, incidentally, this piece was, display was, was in exhibition at the UMFA uh, and then went out to BYU. And it was lost in the process of moving back and forth and was never found. So I was um, not happy with what we were calling sculpture. The, the, the sculpture wasn't resonating when I thought of Rodin, when I thought of the, the sculptors who, as a, as, as a young man, um, really affecting the way I saw myself as a creator. I just wasn't satisfied with that. So I came up with the neologism, which is ontolature. These are objects relating to the nature of being and existence. This is another one that I did, and again, I apologize for the fogginess, but uh, this piece is about uh, six inches by 10 inches, and it contained uh, uh, 
parts of a, of a spirit level, you know, the kind of level you would use for construction. And I pulled those out, and those were for implant, implantation anywhere in my body, anywhere that I might need them. I was in need of that kind of balance. Again, pataphysics. Um, sometimes I would do propositions. Uh, this was a proposition suggesting an addendum be attached or bolted to the Bible. And this was a piece titled Some Place Between the Sacred and the Secular. It was an exploration of form and content, the sensuality of the letter, the sensuality of the word, the idea that the alphabet contains the world as we know it. By assembling the letters in any language, it contains the world as we know it. It's an ecotone. It's a place where two environments are in tension and then resolve. Another pataphysical response uh, was a connection to the earth, an intimate, scaled connection to the earth. Um, it was, it's a bit of personal archaeology. Uh, when I was um, grappling with my place in the universe, as we are on this grain of sand in the universe, and we are grains of sand on this grain of sand, um, baffled by my, my own personal minutia, I dug a hole, took this old lawnmower handle, buried it in the ground, put enough concrete in there to make it stable. And on moonlit nights, I would hold on to it and ride the planet through the cosmos. Pataphysics. Emerging tools, emerging, how do we create, what are we creating from, uh, this piece is titled New Pastels. And it was a precursor to a series of tool makers benches that I'm gonna show you in a moment. And it was transporting an old empty pastel box, um, you know, the kind of pastels that we, we use for drawing. And I substituted the use, the, what were the uh, spaces for the pastels with the collage material. Again, that transformation, what are the materials we use? What are the materials we use as creators? Sometimes this was not conscious what I was doing. 25, 30, 40 years later, I'm seeing these patterns emerge. Um, this is the first tool maker's bench. And you'll see piano hammers emerging a lot in my work. Something about the, the power of a piano hammer piece of felt that is so beautifully executed, the craftsmanship of a piano hammer. And this was a toolmaker's bench for a poet. Um, it's made of glass, concrete, maple, and again, letters, steel letter stamps, the kind they use for marking other pieces of metal. Who but a poet could uh, strike a metal stamp with a piano hammer, not enough weight in the piano hammer to make anything happen. And on a surface of glass plates, make sense of it all and not break anything. Who but a poet could do that? Um, this, in the front of this uh, exhibition, which was a, the former Pierpont Gallery, um, is a toolmaker's bench for a planner and had homes for here and now. I had no idea at the time I was doing this work uh, that one day um, I'd become a city planning director. All this was precursor. This was a toolmaker's bench in front of all these homes for here and now that I had created. Uh, these are the pieces. Uh, they're derivative from uh, houses for the hereafter, which were uh, Mexican, uh, uh, made in Mexico, and they were pieces that were buried with um, uh, people to make sure they had a home in the hereafter, a place to dwell in the hereafter, and they're gorgeous, gorgeous carvings. But at the time that I was doing this, I was a single dad, and I was much more concerned about uh, making a home for my boys homes for here and now. So I, I made many of these homes for here and now. They were extracted, extracted from their place. They were exiled places. Um, again, dealing with the questions that I was trying to manage as a, as a single dad. Different kinds of homemaking. Sort of announcing before I knew it, my, my work as a, as a homemaker. And that's when I started getting into the walls. This is probably the only photo I know of um, that was taken in my first studio, uh, which was just a few blocks north of Mestizo Gallery, if you're familiar with that on 6 West. Um, the build, this, this studio's walls were literally crumbling. Uh, they were leaking. But I love the place as an incubator of ideas and as a place to hone my skills. It was heated with a wood stove. It had jerry-rigged but legal electrical service and had running water only in the warm months of the year. I was eventually displaced by a city building inspector. I was told the building was unsafe and needed to be torn down. This was when I began observing more about city management processes, uh, more about regulations, about inspectors. 
And 20 years after being displaced from this place by an inspector, that inspector became one of my employees in the planning department for several years. These early relationships, these coincidences of time and space. The building, by the way, is never torn down. Um, it's still standing and serves the neighborhood as a bodega. Um, by the way, um, in this room tonight, the Nancy Tessman Auditorium has a deep meaning for me because at the time I was sharing my studio with her husband at the time, Tom Tessman. And at that time, I was also working for Nancy as a children's librarian at Chapman Library, working across disciplines, working with the word, working with letters, working with language, working with story. So I'd been displaced and realized that I wasn't the only artist craftsman who, had been, who was looking for a studio space at the time. All my tools were locked up in that former building. It was a nightmare getting myself back on the road again, so to speak. Um, so I now was embarked on a new creative process, how to create home, different kind of home. My life was sort of in its own ecotone, needing living and workspace, um, creating a place for myself and creating a place for others. And having not had a studio with heat or running water, I have to tell you, I was very motivated. Few things motivate somebody as much as wanting. So this is where the tools and materials really started to change, because instead of using torches, grinders, saws, chisels, files, um, I began using uh, fax machines. I began using typewriter in different ways. Um, I was using a lot of paper. And the old Eccles Browning warehouse on Pierpont uh, was a studio for building and breaking down walls. I recognize a few people here that uh, have lived there. They know what I'm talking about. But especially breaking down regulatory walls, because when we tried to get this project going in the beginning, Living in workspace was not legal in Salt Lake City. So again, working across disciplines, I discovered that I was able to change zoning ordinances. An artist creating zoning ordinances, the creative process. So it was a gorgeous building, um, really beautiful building. Um, it was tired. Um, it was about 81,000 square feet waiting to become something new building that would soon learn how to incubate people's creative lives and provide them with, them with a studio, with a home. And that was my office for a while. And after establishing the, the organization, which was a long process that I won't tell you much about, um, I worked with my dear friend Roger Borgenich, whose office is across the street from here, who became a brilliant uh, uh, executive director of the Community Design Center, known as ASSIST. And together, we built my home. And in this home, I raised my boys for many years. And today, my son, Ben, who's pictured in this image, um, believe it or not, actually has his office directly below where he's sitting in that chair. I'm a big fan of meaningful coincidence. A friend, Vivian Flegel, she had her studio down the way. She raised her daughter there. Uh, Kenny Davis, who's a fine painter, had his studio. And along with about 20 other artists um, who practiced their professions there, we're also being city builders, artists as city builders, working across disciplines, even if only so subtly. We began working the land behind the building. It was a former railroad spur that delivered goods to the warehouse, that's the, the, to, because that's where the building was, and was now learning how to become home to plants again, um, home to food, home to flowers, home to trees, creating habitat for birds displaced by what we call progress. We hired heads of households from the homeless shelter down the street to help us do the work. We observed both the need of and people's eagerness to participate in building the neighborhood. We wanted to build the neighborhood with us. And this was a piece of the journey across disciplines that began a long relationship of integrating social justice into the work. We paid these men a livable wage, we wrote letters of recommendation and helped restore their rightful place in our economy in the community, artists as community builders. New life began to emerge. Urban agriculture, a term that we were just beginning to adopt, was becoming a part of our lives. We began seeing the transformation of the neighborhood and the creation of social space. I didn't even know what social space was as a planner. I didn't even understand what it was, but I began to see it in action 
was a place where creative process emerged inside and out in the shaping of policy, affordable housing, and neighborhood deeply in New England. We incubated, we incubated other nonprofits um, like Art Access, which is a flourishing nonprofit today in a, another one of the art space buildings. Uh, we incubated Spy Hop, another flourishing nonprofit. We were incubators of people and their creative responses, creative responses to the challenges that they saw. We really were being midwives to possibility. And all these organizations began to flourish. The AIA moved their offices. The American Institute of Architects moved their offices there. Um, the Utah Arts Festival moved their offices there. And, and many other organizations. We even had a Buddhist temple that was in the building with us. And we spilled onto the streets for street fairs. We had become a safe place for people to take risks and to contribute to the vibrancy of the human spirit in a neighborhood with the highest crime rates in the state of Utah, the highest poverty rates in the state of Utah. This transformative process that we were engaged in began to spill over into our own lives. So check out this group. This is uh, the original group of artists who were in the building. Not all of them, but 90% uh, of them. You may recognize some of them. Carly Jimenez, Meredith Mensch, uh, Louise Fishman, um, they were beginning their professional lives there. And um, these were the early pioneers changing the Pioneer Park neighborhood. And here's a story about the role that the artists played in creativity within the broader creative community of Salt Lake. So this is not the way the artists usually dress, of course. But we were invited by Ryrie Woodbury, the dance company, to uh, help them celebrate their 20th anniversary. They were holding it in, a, in, the, in the Sheridan Hotel, the big ballroom, and asked us if the artists would please come down and, uh, and help them decorate the space. I said, no, nah, we're not doing that. We, we don't have decorators. We're not going to be decorating the space. Um, but it's a black tie event. Let's see what we might do. Um, if you wanted a creative response to the important creative work you've been doing as dancers, um, maybe we can find a, uh, a way to manage this. So very sneakily, we worked with the Sheraton to get the same uh, clothing, the same uh, 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 ornament that they wear as servers, and got them for the artists so they were dressed as servers. And nobody knew who they were, or very few people knew who they were in the building. Um, and we infiltrated the event. We got the Sheraton to give us all of their old tablecloths, ones that were ready to throw out. We took them into my studio, we painted a target on them. We uh, set the table, we worked with them to set the tables in this ballroom. This is a you know, very formal event. Um, but we did it a little bit differently. There's a twist, I don't know if you can make it out, but um, it's not, not very bright, but um, there's a bottle of glue. There's um, a marker, there's some paper, there's some sticks. Um, so, as part of the place settings, we put art material. And for the rest of the evening, our artists as servers were serving art material in salad bowls, on platters, and turned this place into a creative night, went late into the night. People were even building bridges between their tables, taking off their tuxes and, you know, having a creative response to the creative life of the dancers. It was a dance in itself. It's the kind of work we were doing. We were just exploring, we were participating, we were collaborating. And that's part of our neighborhood. You know, the dance companies are part of our neighborhood, the opera company became part of our neighborhood. That's the way we were integrating the work. The neighborhood was a whole bunch of things. And behind our Pierpont building was another abandoned building, the Uffins Auto Metal Works. It's no longer there. You know, it became a temporary home to men and women facing both chronic mental illness and homelessness. Um, these folks would often knock on my door and look for a place to, uh, excuse me, look for a place to gather to be out of the cold. We couldn't provide that in our building. We did not have the room. That building became a community center for them, a place where they could create, a place where they could write poetry, make paintings, keep each other on their meds, peer support. Um, it would help them keep out of jail, keep out of a hospital, and stay warm. They were our neighbors. They called themselves the Crippled Quill, and they worked in that building until the city found out they had given them a key to the building. Within days of the city's discovery, they came with a bulldozer and took out the building and the Quill's community. As we listened to their stories, we found a deeper place to create solutions for these folks' urgent problems. And 
like this woman who um, had spina bifida. That was only one of her problems. Um, she had, uh, she was a double amputee. Um, she was a drug addict, often was living in the park. We worked closely with her to find a place for her in a new building that we created. Um, we helped her get her kids out of foster care for a while so she could be reacquainted with her children. Um, so here's what we did. We took this building, um, which is across the street from Pierpont. And as an artist and now as an affordable housing developer, my discipline had changed considerably, of course, and I scrambled to put the finances together and keep the building from being demolished by the city. Because they were saying, Mr. Goldsmith, who wants to live in an old warehouse? Those buildings need to come down. But we succeeded despite enormous challenges um, for which our creative responses always found a way to manage. We transformed this dark place, step by step, brick by brick, found these Edward Hopper kinds of uh, panoramas, these Edward Hopper landscapes through the building. And we reframed the landscape both of the neighborhood and of the building itself and created these spaces. And that's where that woman ended up living for a long time. Spaces like this, in a building that should have been torn down, we were told. Spaces like this. Mr. Goldsmith, who wants to live where there's concrete floors and concrete ceilings? In places like this, where Michael Moonbird and Victoria Lyons created the now flourishing nonprofit Bad Dog Rediscovers America, for which he won the uh, Welfare to Work Award from the US Congress back in 1995. By listening to the neighborhood, um, we found out about the needs of people, so we put together a child care for the children of families facing homelessness. Uh, it, was known as the, um, it, was known, it was known as our house had support from the American Brotherhood of Electrical Workers, whose president was a woman, the American Brotherhood of Electrical Workers. And one of the first directors was Amanda Smith, and she, wound up, she ended up becoming the director of environmental quality for the state of Utah after many years. So you see all this incubation, this incubation of engagement, of deeply engaged participation in the crises of our time. There was a coffee shop there, and we had people in our building who had disabilities, and people in the, co in the coffee shop hired these people to work there. It became a microeconomy. We were supporting one another in every way we possibly could. So that building, a building that many thought should be demolished, became a beacon, became a lantern for both the neighborhood and the breadth of possibilities of creative responses to other people's challenges. A few years later, we went to the other side of the tracks. People already thought we were on the other side of the tracks. We took a building that couldn't be salvaged and created a new one where it had been. 60 affordable housing units, seven of those units for women coming out of prison wanting to get reacquainted with their children. We worked on with Catholic Community Services. We were building strategic alliances wherever we possibly could. Small businesses on the main floor. The buildings changed a lot. One of the spaces we incubated was the Community Design Center. It now has their office here um, as part of the library. Um, Spy Hop uh, was there, as, as many of you know, and that space they vacated a few weeks ago, and it's now a community resource center operated by numerous city agencies. So the way buildings learn, the way buildings learn to adapt and become something else was much of what we discovered. So through this process of discovery and seeing the valley, beginning to look into the valley and where might we be able to engage, um, we were frustrated. Many of us were frustrated. We were frustrated by the way the downtown was uh, threatened, by the way it was languishing. And we put together an organization called the Urban Design Coalition, and we did this strategically with the Salt Lake City Arts Council. We were the first urban design committee of any arts council in the United States. Because we were trying to apply those sensibilities, those sensibilities of care, those sensibilities of design excellence in every way that we build this community in response to these mountains, in response to this magnificent oasis on the edge of this desert. So we ran a full page ad, got into a lot of trouble for doing it, had a hard time getting it done. Had a lot of people responding with their goals, their visions of what we might do. This was a precursor, by the way, to Envision Utah. That's a whole story by itself. This is Main Street that we, this is before Photoshop, we had to hire an artist to actually create this image for us. But uh, as you'll see on Main Street, we had uh, 
there was fear that um, First Security Bank, which is located there, might be sold. Well, that happened, became Wells Fargo, of course. Um, we were concerned that uh, Main Street was going to probably lead down to the center of the city, Draper. Mr. Goldsmith, that's not going to ever happen. You're not going to have 20, 30 story buildings down there. Let's see, the prison site is about to be what? So we're anticipating these and trying to imagine terracotta building among many were taken to the landfill. But we salvaged what we could like this piece and we placed it in the temporary gardens that we created there. We took these incredible 18 inch by 18 inch timbers that were going to go to the landfill and we create places for people. Um, we took the um, areas, the, the, the places that were the footings for the building and created benches out of them. Um, we created story upon story upon layers as a creative response to in fact, the city didn't know what they were going to do with the block at that time. They didn't know what they were going to be building. There was only one building that, that remained, which was the Utah One Center. And at the time, in my frustration with planning, again, I had no idea I was going to find myself in that role one day. I created a uh, toolmaker's bench for the planning commission. Right there. It was 12, 12 feet long, 18-inch timbers set on concrete. The idea that it was sort of like the Last Supper, I could imagine them standing behind there, imagining the future of their city. Toolmaker's bench for the Planning Commission. As I mentioned in the introduction, uh, in looking at the city and how to manage it, uh, with Moshe Safdi, uh, we put together the Physical Fitness of Cities exhibition across the street at City Hall. It was, a, it was a way of looking at the Winter Olympic Games as something rather petty. Because we don't celebrate architects that way. We don't have Olympics for architects. We don't have Olympics for engineers. We don't have Olympics for those people. Um, so why don't we just take the Culture Olympiad and invite those best possibilities from around the world to uh, display their work, display their vision. So we had, we had uh, submissions from all over the world. Had an exhibition across the street for about uh, 70 days that, that really celebrated the excellence of the designers and the thinkers, the transformers around the world. Simultaneously with my work as the planning director, now I was clearly across disciplines, um, put together a book titled The Walkable Downtown, which began to look at the equation of mobility in our city. The place dominated by the automobile, not only affecting our lungs, but our, our diabetes, our obesity, all these other problems. How do we create these places? Um, this ended up being an award-winning project. I mention this because we're still trying to implement it today. We're still not making those moves, those gestures, at the rate of which the sense of urgency demands, in my estimation. So visual literacy is also a big part of what we were doing at the time. That's, that's again, taking the work as artist and creator into how do we use visual literacy to inform change? How do we do this instead of using language to inform change? Because pictures do speak a thousand words. I had spent some time in Freiburg, Germany. Um, where I had seen this incredible bridge over a um, railway system that was a multimodal railway system. So it had buses, it had trains, long distance trains, short, short uh, distance trains. Um, that the piece on the left, that's a bicycle garage. That entire building is a bicycle garage set up like a dry cleaners. Where you take your bike and you put it on a hook and they give you a number. When you come back, you, get it, you give them the number and it drops off your bike. And if you need to maintain, they can maintain it. They can do whatever you need. Um, so I saw this multimodal place and thought it was absolutely magnificent. And when the city was talking about redoing the North Temple Viaduct, which you're familiar with down by Gateway, um, first they had said that there was no way they could possibly get right light rail to go over that bridge, which we knew wasn't the case. Um, it disrupted a lot of possibilities for downtown, um, which I can tell you about later if you're interested. But I presented this to the UTA and to um, uh, all the transportation planners, and they said, Mr. Goldsmith, you know, there's just no way we're not going to be able to do that. We're not going to be able to connect people connections on that bridge, even though that is a connector to the airport, that is a connected to Gateway. But then again, if you've been down there, you know they did it. It was visual literacy. So it's like we're curators, right? We're curators of ideas, and we can place them in front of decision makers, policy makers who aren't trained as planners, aren't creative city builders. How can we succeed? And the same thing happened later. This was in my, my last months of uh, working uh, with Rocky. He's still a dear friend, but I just couldn't stand the uh, city council wanted me to be a regulator anymore. He hired me to be a creator. That's what I came to do. When the city was told by the LDS Church they were going to be tearing down the Crossroads Mall, or that they were going to be rehabilitating the Crossroads Mall, rather, um, I had an idea, because I knew Main Street very well. My family had been here for over 100 years. I knew Main Street. My family's business was on Main Street. I knew the city very well. I knew that street very well. 
And I knew that down there had been horrible disruptions years ago when Regent Street uh, uh, was closed, when uh, Richard Street, excuse me, was closed. And how can we begin to develop a network, a pedestrian network, a visual network that would invite people to use the city? So I hired a couple of friends of mine, um, Peggy McDonough, who's now the president of MHT and Architects, and Eric Migas, who, who works with her. Um, and I said, look, I want to propose something to the LDS Church um, that uh, could open up the streets, create mixed-use residential down there, something which they had pushed back on terribly. They did not believe that housing should be downtown. It's okay, Mr. Goldsmith, on the west side of town, but downtowns are for culture and commerce. There should not be housing in the downtown. So I put together this idea. And you can see on the map, so there's a symphony hall. There's a little passageway that runs through that block. I threw some housing in there. We wanted to take it all the way through there, but what we found out, and Peggy said, look, you can't use our names with this because they already have us under contract for the redesign of the ZCMI Mall. So if they know that we're working on this, the church is going to fire us, so we can't afford to lose one of our biggest um, down from the Tower of David, a place where Christianity, Judaism, Islam all come together. And creating a well of tears seemed appropriate to me. And most recently, I just got back from India where we're working on portable water museums uh, in Hyderabad. And this is a proposal that's being done by some students I've been collaborating with there and here. Um, there's actually a truck that can move through the city and uh, open up in places and celebrate water there. This is a place where the water table in the past 10 years has been so rapidly urbanized. The water table used to be 10 feet below the surface. You took your bucket down to the well, and in 10 feet you would get a bucket of water. It's now 800 feet, and in some places, it's 1,200 feet. This is the sense of urgency. And if the children of Hyderabad can understand their relationships with water and the human spirit, water and religion, uh, water in every possible way, maybe they can become different stewards of the water that's there, because 40% of the water that comes into the city is lost because of leaking pipes. Students have been working on actual designs for this. Their creative response is sometimes an engineering response. And what became quite exciting about this um, for us is we were talking about how to celebrate the water there. We noticed that the trucks, every truck, if you've been to India, you've seen this. The workmen take such pride in their trucks, whether it's moving water or moving sewage or moving building materials or moving whatever. They treat their trucks like their jewelry. They keep them clean. They paint these motifs on them. It's because they know that this is where their livelihood comes from, so they take care of their tools. They take care of their tools. But one of the things we noticed is that the water tanks on tops of the buildings, the water tanks are just these black plastic containers. So there's this water, the water that's the source of life. The water, all the water that's in the world today is all the water we've ever had and all the water that will ever be. So why do you put in this black tank on the top of your building? Why can't it be celebrated? So they proposed having Hyderabad be a city of water tanks that are painted to celebrate the water like they celebrate their trucks. It's a beautiful idea. It was presented uh, about 10 days ago to the U.S. consulate there. The U.S. consulate is actually looking at funding this, looking at funding the water museum as well. So this is the way that the students began to visualize this, to visualize change. A city that's grown from 3 million, they don't even know how many people, could be 10, could be 12 million, don't even know how many people are there because of the rapid urbanization of these places. And coming back home, uh, students that I worked with a few years ago um, have put together uh, what's called the Seven Canyons Trust. It's a nonprofit that was born out of a classroom at the University of Utah, where students have taken it up and out of the classroom into the marketplace of uh, city life here follow up on the Seven Canyons Fountain. How can we, over 100 years, bring all the creeks back to the surface? Can we do it? Of course we can do it. Bigger projects have been done around the world for what we call daylighting the water. Um, that the students took this kernel of an idea to create a bona fide nonprofit organization that has now had, had $600,000 that it's working with to begin the first part of the daylighting down in an underserved neighborhood in Glen, Glendale. Creative responses creative responses to the problems of our time. And I think of the meaningful projects that uh, I have uh, been engaged with uh, this year, and there are so many. I am such a privileged man to be able to do this work with so many people and in so many places. I was working with one of my students uh, in urban ecology. Her name is Naba Faizi. She's the young woman on the right. 
Her mother is the uh, head of a Muslim Girl Scout troop here in uh, the Valley. And as part of the work that I do with uh, my colleague Chelsea Gauthier, who's here in the audience in the Center for Living City, um, I try to advance the ideas of Jane Jacobs. And we do this with a whole range of, of, of tools. And one of the tools we use is a book. And the book is called The Genius of Common Sense. And it's written for uh, adolescents, you know, 13, 14, 15 year old kids. And it talks about the genius of their common sense, how they take their observations. How do they take their observations, find a problem, find an opportunity, and actually act on that observation? So Nava, with her mom, created a Girl Scout merit badge that is about observing and acting, observing and acting, relying sometimes on the phenomenological responses we have. How does it feel sometimes, the, the things that we know, um, but responding, responding, because there's no time to waste. And uh, that's the merit badge. And what's really beautiful about this project about amplifying the voices of women around the world. They're the ones who carry the water in so many places, in so many ways. One of the reasons why the irony of my speaking up here tonight is Hillary is accepting her nomination sort of comes to life for me because if we can succeed, and we're getting close to the Ford Foundation, it looks like we're going to fund this. If every Girl Scout, Scout troop in the world has hundreds of thousands of young women who begin to rely on the genius of their common sense to observe and engage the world around them, but we invite creative responses like the ones you've seen, I think we can have a better place. Thank you. So I've been told that uh, we have time for questions. This is a note, just as a note. Um, we are recording this right now, so if you would like to ask a question, please wait for the microphone um, before you ask your question so that everyone can hear and so that we can get it on record. Thank you. The transition of being a, you know, an artist into being a community planner into being um, from the place of the practical. Um, so for instance, I would never think that it would be possible to get carpentry skills and knock down walls <laughs> and then uh, when the and to know when that's that's possible and and to know who to recruit so could you talk a little bit more about the pragmatism behind that transition yeah there, there, there are a number of ways that uh, I, I look at that and, um, and and I thank you for the question because I do believe that everybody everybody has this it's the cultural constructs that get in our way. Um, our evolutionary impulse as creators is, is, is we're born with that. Just, it, comes, it comes with your birth. And then how you apply it, the first thing you have to do is you have to break out of the, the narrative. So the narrative, the sculptors make these things, and architects make these things, and musicians do these things, and that. No, no, if we just allow ourselves to take that creative impulse and apply it, then we can apply it based upon what we're attached to. What we're attached to can be, uh, um, homeless, uh, the, the children of homeless, uh, people facing homelessness in a neighborhood. What might we do there? Because that's really serious and we see it every day and we're uncomfortable with that. Um, that's one way to respond to it. Um, I think the other way to do it is to um, let go of the idea that we as artists adorn places, that we ornament places. You know, the, unfortunately in the, in, the, in the blog that was really nice that the UMFA put out, MFA put out, it talked about um, traditional societies. And my comment about the, the, the was a little bit misunderstood is that traditional artists in African societies, particularly amongst the Yoruba, um, they were members of the community to respond to any problem that was there. If somebody needed an archway for the doorway into their tent, they could make that for them. They needed an amulet to put around their neck so it would uh, make them fertile. The artist would make that. If the artist needed to interpret a dream, the artist could interpret a dream. And that was his role or her role in that society. And they were usually other. They were usually seen as somebody odd in the community, something that many of us feel as artists in our community, right? So very early on, they're tapped. So I think that the answer to the question is what the transition is. The transition is really allowing ourselves to 
experience the places around us in ways that are not a um, reality movie, that are not a landscape painting. They involve real people, real systems, other animals. We have empathy towards all forms of life. And whatever we respond to around us, respond to that. Not respond to making objects for the halls and walls of usually um, the institutions of um, Europeans. Thanks for coming and uh, giving us that walk down memory lane too, and just remembering how many things you've been a part of in the city, and it's impressive. But I just had an idea when you were answering that question that sometimes um, when you com com compare a, a city like Salt Lake to maybe a, an African country, we have so many things, so many resources, so many so much. Um, sometimes the creativity comes in, I think, when there's less um, to work with or less, you know, you ha your, the creativity that's in all of us really rises to the occasion and you find ways to do things with bicycle spokes or plastic water jugs or whatever you, that you have. But here, just because the necessity isn't there, we get lazy. So that's, I mean, I think you just made me think of that, and I think it might be, have some merit. <laughs> I, I hear you, um, and I agree with you uh, completely. Um, it's been one of the big challenges of uh, coming back to the U.S., having spent some time in uh, uh, Ethiopia this summer, a time in uh, India, a place where we were invited. This was not uh, um, uh, poverty tourism. This was, we were invited in to uh, find creative responses to problems. And a couple of things that come to mind with your talking about this, it is a, about our privilege, right? Coming back to the bubble of this place and understanding our privilege um, makes me very frustrated when I'm sitting in a lobby and hearing somebody complaining about how difficult it is that they started building their house and how difficult it is that the contractor, you know, strange problems. But I think the things that I've noticed more than anything else is that the people who have so little in these places, I look at the spark in their eye, the dance in their step, they seem to have everything. When I look at the people here who have everything, and I see the way they kind of move slowly and have no spark in their eye, have no dance in their step. The people have everything, really have nothing. I think in response to that idea of privilege. You know, Daniel uh, Martin once said, um, uh, John Fowle said in the book, Daniel Martin, we create from what we lack, not from what we have. In my experience, and there's another artist in here who may want to comment about this, if I've been given a commission and I have a huge budget and no time frame, I'm in trouble. Give me a really tight budget and a really tight time frame, and I can create until the cows come home. And you probably have had a similar experience, right? We create from what we lack, not from what we have. That's another hand over here. Uh, the, the, was it Crippled Cafe? Was Cripple Quill. Cripple Quill. Yeah. Um, disappeared. And Art Space, I believe, is on the block. Uh, are those other projects going to go through an evolutionary process and are we going to get something, um, well, judgmental term, better or worse when that goes through? Do you know what general direction that's taking now? Well, Art Space, the nonprofit, has a number of buildings. Um, that building um, where your seatmate is, just had to sadly leave um, a few months ago, um, is learning to become something else. Uh, we preserved that building, actually, from being demolished. Uh, American Cities Corps came in in uh, 1979, a, a $500,000 contract from the city to decide how to develop that side of town. And that building was coming down um, entirely. So we preserved the 1910 Eccles Browning Warehouse. So that part is good. What's bad is that um, those people who have been displaced after doing so much to reshape that neighborhood and make so much money for so many people through their participation in changing that neighborhood. Um, that's very sad. But Art Space, the nonprofit, has the Rubber Company building, which is guaranteed to have affordable housing until 2095. 
that has to be that way. That's required by law. Um, the bridge company, the, the bridge projects down the street, of course, BIHOP was. Same thing. Has to be affordable till um, 2098. That's written into the um, uh, uh, codes, covenants, and restrictions. Um, I'm not sure if that's the case down in the commons and now I have another building that's coming out. So the organization that we started um, is flourishing and providing affordable housing to a diversity of people. What happens to Eccles Browning Warehouse, your guess is as good as mine. My son has his nonprofit there. He's doing brilliant work uh, for animal rights around the world. I'm just going to hold on to that as a, a kernel of possibility. 